So now we have four presentations left, okay, two of mine and two of my colleague. And the first one is about arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy is one of the most uh, important diseases in the field of sport cardiology because, as you know, it's one of the leading causes of sudden death in the athletes. But on the other hand, it's not a very, a very easy disease. So I will try to point out what I think are the most important uh, messages um, for a sports physician about arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So the title of my presentation, in fact, is what you need to know, in my opinion. Uh, of course, <coughs> questions are very, well, are very welcome. <coughs> what is RVC? It's an arm muscle disease. Uh, it's a cardiomyopathy. Uh, which is uh, due to mutation in the desmosomes. So if you remember about when you study biology, desmosomes are the structures that link the myocytes. So one myocyte is linked to the other with these desmosomes, okay? So if the desmosome is weak, why, when the, uh, the, the, the myocyte contracts, they can rupture. So, and this is the, basic, the physiopathologic basis of rheumogenic cardiomyopathy. And when, this, uh, when there is these ruptures of the myocytes, the myocytes uh, die, and there is a, a replacement by fibrofatty tissue, which is the one that can give rise to the arrhythmias. The clinical presentation of the disease is mainly arrhythmic. On the later stage of the disease, you can have heart failure, but the majority of patients live well with the disease. The only problem are arrhythmias. So again, the natural history is characterized by a progressive loss of myocardium and the left ventricular involvement that, could, that usually occur in the later phases in the classical variants of RVC, but there are patients with early uh, or, or even predominant left ventricular involvement and ventricular electrical instability. In the 90s, it was the uh, in, in my region, the Veneto region, northeast of Italy, it was the leading cause uh, of sudden death in athletes. And you will see later that it's also today, but with a caveat. Um, the problem with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy is that if you have an hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the diagnosis is very easy. 50 millimeters of thick, wall thickness, you have a diagnosis. On dilated cardiomyopathy is also easy. Less than 50% of ejection fracture is not normal, full stop. In rheumogenic cardiomyopathy, it's characterized by multiple abnormalities of the heart that can occur on various degrees of severity, but none of them is diagnostic. So none is enough to make a diagnosis. You, have, you need to have multiple abnormalities. So to make a diagnosis, you have a very, very easy list of criteria that you can see here, okay? Um, and only with a combination of criteria, which are uh, di divided into major and minor criteria, you make a diagnosis. But of course, your task is not to make a diagnosis. You're not a cardiologist involved in cardiomyopathies. You are a sport physician, or at least a, a physician dealing with athletes. Your task is to suspect the disease, okay? So I'm going to go through these uh, six points very quickly to see how you can suspect the disease. The first feature of a rheumogenic cardiomyopathy are the um, electrocardiographic abnormalities. So most of the sudden cardiac death prevention uh, was the, that we demonstrated in the Veneto region with this, this famous curve that in every Congress you see that there, there was a... Um, um, decrease of 19% of sudden death in the athletes after implementation of the Italian uh, HEG-based participation screening was due to identification of cardiomyopathies, and in particular, hemogenic cardiomyopathies, which demonstrated prominent HEG abnormalities in the majority of people. 50, 60% of, of patients with hemogenic cardiomyopathy have a, a electrocardiographic abnormalities, but it's very important that electrocardiographic abnormalities are seen in 90, 80 to 90% of patients with a rheumatic cardiomyopathy and life-threatening arrhythmias. So in the, in the electrocardiogram is not a normal in every uh, RVC patient, but in my, the vast majority of those who experience life-threatening arrhythmias, it is abnormal. So and you can have very different, uh, very different uh, HG abnormalities, the most common of, of which uh, are T-wave inversions. Okay, in the right precordial lead V1, V3, that are the ones that explore the right ventricle. Okay, because the right ventricle is positioned 
just behind the, the sternum. So the, 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 the first three leads that are the ones that are just close to the sternum are the ones that explore the right ventricle, okay? So what if you find a T wave uh, in an athlete? The first thing, uh, just to recap some messages that the, uh, Professor Pelicia gave you yesterday, but the first thing that you have to, uh, to consider is, has the athlete complete his pubertal development? Because in children before puberty, having t inverted T waves in the precordial leads is quite common, 15, 20, 30 percent. But as, puber as they develop pubertal development, um, uh, the T waves needs to uh, normalize. And in fact, in this study that Professor Pericia cited yesterday, the single the, all, the single and only independent predictor of T way of normalization in uh, children was the pubertal development. So, giving a cutoff of age, like the, recommend, the, in, uh, the international recommendation for interpretation of HCG in the athletes, is not very biological sense. The biological sense is the puberty. So, it doesn't mean if you are 13, 40, or 15 year old. If you have complete your pubertal development, you do not you should not show negative T waves. And this is, in my opinion, a very important uh, message. And in fact, in our study, the only people, uh, uh, Professor Pelicia told yesterday that 6% uh, 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 of, um, of uh, children exhibited negative T waves in, in HEG, which is quite a high prevalence, but it didn't tell you that the majority of these uh, children were prepubertal. After puberty, only a, a small minority of children con continued to have negative T waves, and among them, there were some with cardiomyopathies, okay? So, and what, that, what if the uh, T wave in inversion persists after puberty? Of course, another thing that you have to watch to do cuts is the, uh, is the se uh, ST segment configuration between, because especially in Afro-Caribbean athletes, if there is a um, ST segment J point elevation and the T wave inversion is limited to leave one v three, this is easily an early repolarization variant because uh, patients with cardiomyopathy usually do not have J point and ST segment elevation. But we, I will skip it because uh, Prof uh, Professor Pelicia yesterday talked about it quite extensively. And another important thing that has just been demonstrated by the group of London, which is a very important group, is that um, the chance to find benign T-way inversion is, is much higher in females than in males, particularly if you are talking about T-way inversion just in lead V1 and V2. You know that some female, some young ladies can show inverted T-way in V1 and V2. On the other hand, T-way inversion in males is much, uh, is much rarer, in particular if the T waves involves also, the negative T waves also go to lead V3, and not just V1 and V2. On the other hand, rheumogenic cardiomyopathy is a, has a strong male predominance. So, from, another, from a side, you have a female, which is, a, which is less likely to have a rheumogenic cardiomyopathy and is much more likely to have an idiopathic inverted T waves. On the other hand, if you find a male with a post-pubertal male, no j point ST segment elevation, and inverted T wave in V1, V2, V3, the, the suspicion of a cardiomyopathy is much higher. Okay? This is, in my opinion, an important, an important message. So, the majority of you, I think, believes, believe that uh, normalization of the T wave, inverted T wave during stress test is a good thing. Actually, it does not make any difference. Both in arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy patients and in normal individuals, T waves can persist or normalize during exercise tests. This, this, this is not an important test for differential diagnosis. This is, at least in the field of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, the behavior of, of um, negative T waves during stress test is very variable, so you do not have to trust it. So in conclusion, if when there are anterior negative T waves very suspect for LVC, when they persist beyond pu puberty, when they are not associated with J-points elevation, when they stand beyond V2, and when they are observed in a male athlete. Another feature of uh, very quick, quickly of the rheumogenic cardiomyopathy is an epsilon wave, but you will not encounter it in your clinical practice because it is a sign of a very advanced disease. 
As you can see, there is this fragmented QRS complex in the lead uh, exploring the, the uh, right ventricle, and but it is not very easily to recognize, easily recognize. And again, this is not this is a, um, observed only in a minority and very advanced disease. Ventricular arrhythmias, we already talked about it yesterday. Um, um, Adimogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy uh, involves mainly the right ventricle. So what do you expect to see in V1? A negative or positive QRS complex? A negative, okay? Left bundle branch block like complex, means coming from the right ventricle, okay? If you have a, also an inferior axis, so it comes from the right ventricular outflow tract up here, the chance of having a disease is less. If it is a superior axis, so the, the, the coerce complex is negative in the inferior leads 2, 3, and AVF, it means that it comes from the apex or the free wall, so the chances of a disease is a, are a little bit higher. But, of course, the problem is not, they're not premature ventricular beats, isolated, but sustained ventricular tachycardia that can, of course, lead to sudden death in uh, rheumogenic cardiomyopathy. Another very important point, how do I diagnose rheumogenic cardiomyopathy with imaging? Imaging, the criteria for um, uh, diagnosis of rheumogenic cardiomyopathy needs two features. First is a regional right ventricular wall motion abnormalities. Why? Because the fiber fatty replacement involves certain areas of the right ventricle each time. So you will have, for example, the apex, which is not contracting, and the rest of the ventricle, which is contracting. So we will have an, a regional akinesia or dyskinesia or aneurysm. Hypokinesia is not enough because it's not very easy to, to identify as a low specificity. And so the first element is a regional wall motion abnormalities. The second element, you need to have a global dilation or dysfunction of the ventricles. You need the two things together to talk about a rheumogenic cardiomyopathy. So I will show you what an akinesia is. Okay, this is a right ventricular ventriculography. As you can see, in the basal part of the right ventricle, this part is not contracting. There is an aneurysm. This is a regional wall motion abnormalities. And this is particularly important in athletes because as demonstrated by Flavio Dacenzi and uh, the collaborators with a collabor collaborating study with the institute here in Rome, the right ventricle of the athletes is quite difficult to, to judge because there are, it is very um, common to find right ventricular dilation and there is an overlap between the degree of right ventricular dilation of atlas and those that you may encounter in a rheumogenic cardiomyopathy. So right ventricular dilation alone is not enough, okay? So right ventricular regional kinesia and no dilation, dysfunction of the right ventricle, excuse me, the first message is that right ventricular dilation alone with no wall motion abnormalities is not enough. On the other hand, isolated wall motion abnormalities of the right ventricle without global dilation dysfunction is not, alone, is not enough again. Because as uh, Viviana Maestrini yesterday showed you, a particular magnetic resonance is not uncommon to find some bulging of the apex of the right ventricle, etc. that alone are not enough for a differential, for a diagnosis of hemogenic cardiomyopathy. The third important point is that the disease usually starts on the inflow part of the right ventricle, so in the subtricuspidal area. And for those of you who perform echocardiography, they need to know the standard echocardiography um, projection okay, does not explore this area. Because if you, if you see a, a, short, a parasternal short axis view, you have the right ventricular outflow tract and the free wall of the right ventricle, and in the, in the um, um, an apical four chamber U, you have the, um, the free wall, the lateral free wall in the apex, but the bottom of the right ventricle is not explored by the standard views. So you need to perform a, sp a special evaluation. This is the um, inflow view of the right ventricle, which is not included in the standard echocardiographic evaluation. So if you have the suspect of an arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, you have to tell your echocardiographist because it needs to perform this particular view 
to see if in this area of the right ventricle there is a, a wall motion abnormalities, which is where the most often these uh, wall motion abnormalities are found. This is another important message, in my opinion. Genetic testing. So, erythromyelogenic cardiomyopathy is, is not a congenital, because you don't see it when a, a child was, is born, but it's a, 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 an inherited, so a genetically um, inherited cardiomyopathy. So you inherited the gene defect from, from the beginning of your life. So in theory, genetic analysis should may uh, help you to diagnose uh, the disease at a very early stage, okay? It may be very useful. On the other hand, the sensitivity of spur participation evaluation is limited to the overt form. So you need to develop the disease to see electrocardiographic abnormalities, etc. Today, genetic testing has become much more easy to perform. The costs are, have decreased. Uh, with a, in a few months, you can screen the entire DNA. So it's very appealing also for commercial region, uh, reasons. So there are many private laboratories that sell genetic testing. So physicians are uh, often, uh, we, they, they ask themselves whether they should, they should perform a genetic testing. Problem with the rheumogenic cardiomyopathy is that the yield of genetic testing is low. In, in isolated cases, uh, it is difficult to, uh, only 50-60% of individuals have a dysmosomal gene mutation, and to tell apart uh, pathogen um, disease-causing genetic mutation and uh, variants of unknown significance, uh, so we don't know whether they are disease mutation or not, is not easy. So genetic testing should be reserved to confirm the diagnosis when the diagnosis is already done based on a clinical ground, or to screen uh, in the context of a familial evaluation. So for example, I have the disease, they identify, they, they identify the genetic mutation, and then they can screen my family members for the same genetic mutation. But this is not, you cannot base your diagnosis in an equivocal case on genetic testing. So another important issue maybe probably the most important issue today, the left dominant variant. So erythromyelogenic cardiomyopathy is usually a right ventricular disease. But in, probably because of some genetic variants, there are some cases in which the disease predominantly affects the left ventricle. So the, the, disease, the, the, the fiber fatty replacement is seen most on the left ventricle than in the right ventricle. This was the case of um, uh, our player, Pier Mario Morosini, who died suddenly in 2012. These are, this is his uh, autopsy that was published. And as you can see, the right ventricle is thick and normal. But there is this thin layer of whitish tissue that a microscopic examination was found to be a fiber fatty replacement. This was a left dominant disease variant, and unfortunately, uh, the electrocardiogram is normal in the majority of cases. The echocardiogram is normal in the majority of cases. You need to suspect it and perform a magnetic resonance because otherwise this abnormal tissue cannot be found. And this is important because if we see our uh, re registry of uh, sudden death in the athletes, um, unfortunately this was not yet published but just uh, an abstract of the American art, um, during the period 1981-2014, we collected 75, 75 cases of sudden death in the athletes. 26 of them were uh, arimogenic cardiomyopathy. But the important thing is that before 1998, where we were not so good as we are at screening athletes, the majority of sudden death were classic right dominant variants. Today, that we identify early these variants, those who die suddenly die because of a left dominant variant of arimogenic cardiomyopathy. So arimogenic cardiomyopathy is still the, the cause of sudden, the, 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 the leading cause of sudden death, but in the left dominant variant, which is very difficult to recognize. And this has been confirmed by a, rich, a recent paper by a group of Rome, the first name is Di Gioia, who found that the left dominant arimogenic cardiomyopathy is today the most f frequent cause of sudden death, at least here in Italy. Um, the, the, the sudden rheumogenic uh, cardiomyopathy, left dominant rheumogenic cardiomyopathy mirrors the right dominant variant, but the lateral negative T waves, which are observed in less than 50% of cases, arrhythmias with a right bundle branch morphology, so again, right bundle branch morphology means 
positive QRS complex in V1, which means that the arrhythmia comes from the left ventricle, which is not normal for an athlete. The echo is usually normal. At magnetic resonance, you see that something that you now can recognize, the late enhancement, so contrast agent in the, in the muscle, meaning that this is an abnormal, there is an abnormal tissue. Finally, sport and the rheumogenic cardiomyopathy. Probably a rheumogenic cardiomyopathy is one of the few uh, diseases for which there is a solid scientific evidence against competitive sports activity. Because there is a number of reasons why competitive sports activities can favor, by, with the stress, the, the ruptures of these desmosomes and favor both the uh, disease itself and the occurrence of arrhythmias. So competitive sport activity uh, uh, guidelines, both American and uh, European guidelines, agree that competitive sport activity is not, uh, is not permitted to patients with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy and probably even desmosomal gene mutation carriers with no sign of disease. But this doesn't mean that a patient, a young patient with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, needs to be sedentary because leisure time, uh, mild to moderate physical activity, uh, has not demonstrated any harm. So you need to uh, switch from uh, pre-participation uh, screening to uh, physical activity prescription in this case. So uh, to recap, what you need to know. Electrocardiogram. Anterior T wave inversion are present in 60% of cases, but up to 90% of patients suffer with sustained VT. However, they, may, they must be evaluated in view of gender, pubental development, and concomitant J-point ST segment elevation. Arrhythmias uh, usually show a left bundle branch block inferior axis configuration, but on the other hand, right bundle branch block like arrhythmias can suggest a left dominant arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. Imaging, you need a combination of regional wheel motion abnormalities and global dilation dysfunction, otherwise this is not enough. Genetic analysis has low sensitivity in isolated non-familial cases, so the diagnosis must be clinical, and do not, perform, do not forget to screen also family members. Finally, left dominant variant, if you suspect it, uh, unexplained negative T waves in V4, V6, or right bundle branch block arrhythmias, then you need to perform a magnetic resonance. A sport, no, no competitive sports activity, yes, moderate intensity exercise. Thanks.